Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we might get started in the interest of trying not to finish too late. Um, thank you for coming to the, to the final session of today's um, series of presentations. It's a continuation of the in-water cleaning, um, including hull grooming. Um, there's a, an interesting set of four presentations, so I'm sure those of you who are uh, interested in, in this topic or maybe just trying to understand a bit more about it will find them very interesting. Particularly the first speaker, um, Jeff Swain from the Florida Institute of Technology. Jeff's had a long history of um, looking at um, hull grooming technologies and um, I personally am very interested in hearing um, his presentation on that today particularly in relation to the fact that it's talking about taking it from the research phase into the reality. Um, yeah. I guess that means I can leave. <laughs> but it's amazing. Uh, so John and John, thanks for inviting me. I've never been to a meeting with so much sort of regulation and thoughts about basically how you're going to manage this whole process. And it took me back a little bit because I have been sort of thinking about these things for a long time. And my first dry docking was about 1978 in the King George V dock in Southampton. And it was on a passenger liner back then called the Oriana. And the coatings were removed with sandblasting, literally sandblasting, right? And there was very little protection for the workers. And then the paint was reapplied with rollers. And it was really regulations from health and safety and also technical advances that if you go and do a dry dock today, you pretty well have robots, magnetic robots, hydro blasters, they remove and capture all the coatings, that's in a good dry dock. And you've got airless spray, which really is technically very good at achieving the sort of wet film thickness you desire for the coating. And the reason I say this, being here and listening to all the regulations, I'm hoping and I'm thinking we're going to go the same direction with basically how we clean or manage fouling controlled coatings on, on ship hulls. So, um, I've been very fortunate. I've been supported by the Office of Naval Research since the mid-90s, actually. And about 12 years ago, they came up with this concept of grooming. And with ONR, the other group who were initially involved in this was Sea Robotics. And Sea Robotics now have a commercial grooming capture system. I'm not sure how they're doing. But I wish Don the best of success with everyone else. Anyway, he's joined the, the commercial group who are trying to give a service to the industry. And then we work with NAVC. Eric's here and people, they've been advising for us. And more recently, because one of the thoughts about how do you really fully automate, and that's the idea, a hull grooming system, you need control and navigation. And so we're now working with a group called um, Green Sea. And hopefully we're going to carry on, as uh, Richard said, going from research to reality. You'll see there are a lot of people here. The other thing, I mean, I'm a professor, right? So it's been an incredible opportunity to train young people. And these are all graduate students. And uh, without them, I mean, what do I do anymore? It's frightening. I, I don't know. And then, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so this is the group from last summer. We had quite a healthy group of us. And uh, every Friday is our field day when we, we go out and do the work. So grooming. Grooming, the initial project, most of you probably think of it in terms of hull bug. Hull bio-inspired underwater grooming. And this is just one of my most favorite creatures on this planet, right? It's nature's engineer. And you look at this thing, right? Distributional, topic, tropical and temperate, slow moving, goes up to 36 feet in length, 36 tons, a design life of 100 plus years with no dry docking. It's incredible. And it gets groomed, right? And we all know that there are a lot of marine organisms out there that actually have this sort of symbiotic relationship with animals that will come and, uh, and help them keep clean. Okay, what am I going to do? I've got to go fast. The drivers, the definitions, our test facilities, grooming and some of our results. Grooming versus cleaning and then the reality. Where are we going? So our drivers, US Navy, and we talked yesterday about the difference between Navy ships and commercial ships. But they spend a lot of their time PSI. And the Navy have the Navy ship's technical manual, and that basically gives them guidance of when they clean. 
And they actually don't clean until they've got a, maybe a 20% cover of this rating, fouling release, a fouling rating of 40, or a 10% cover on a fouling release closing with a fouling rating of 50. So they've fouled before they actually get clean. And in a paper by Mike Schultz and Eric Holmes here, a group of people, and I know a lot of people have looked at this, they've said, well, what is the effect basically on the performance and the cost of, of the vessels? And the primary cost of hull fouling is due to increased fuel consumption. And their calculations suggested that for a DDG frigate, the savings of $12 million per ship over 15 years if the hull condition was maintained at a founding rating of 10, which is basically slightly deteriorated coating and, and biofilm. That was driver number one. Driver number two is that we're funded by the Environmental Quality Program, and one of the things they're looking for benign anti-founding and founding release materials. They're looking basically to improve the way that we actually control and manage founding. And so the program manager at the time was uh, Dr. Steve McIlvaney, and we talked about this, and we asked the question, is there a better way to manage biofounding? Wendy Simmons on Monday said, well, she asked some nine and 12 year olds, I think the same question. The best way is simple, clean more often, right? I mean, eventually we came to this conclusion ourselves. And so we came up with a grooming concept and I say we came up with it. Dr. McIlvaney was amazing because he always held our feet to the fire. He said, no, this is grooming, right? And remember, this is a, a, a research project. We're trying to move the technology. It was the 2020 Navy, now 2030 Navy. So it's not necessarily something you're going to take off the shelf and solve your problems. It's got to be a proactive method to maintain coatings as smooth and fouling free. Your ships are combat ready. Applied by small, inexpensive. And the idea is to go fully autonomous, like a Roomba. Right? And why not? You look what's happened to drones. I mean, just amazing act synergistically with the hull coatings. And this is really where the technology comes in. You know, it's not just a brush. It's the bristles, it's the tufts, it's the forces, it's how you apply that brush to the coating. And every coating is different. So initially we want to remove silts, organics, incipient fouling. You want to maintain the coating function. You do not want to degrade the coating. And because, you know, the O&R program, maybe we've got chemists out there who can design coatings that will actually act synergistically with grooming. Bigger picture. Does it, oh, it does not require capture or disposal. That's a brave comment from me, having you know, recently listened to all the capture that's going on. There'll be no risk of invasive species because there's no fouling. That's the theory, right? No risk from biocide pre-coatings. But what we've got to look at is what's it going to do to the output of coatings that have active biocides? And I'll show you some data on that shortly. Incorporated as part of a ship operation, you now have to manage it. You know, you have to really start to think about your hull. Frequency to match operational schedule, removes divers from the water, and extended time between dry docking, because you're managing the coating, you're not cleaning it and destroying it. <clears throat> okay, early research. So this concept came up. We said, so, well, is it going to work or not? Let's be simple. And we went to the local hardware store and we got a little simple car windshield sponge. We applied a weight to it and we put a bunch of four by an inch panels in the water. And once a week we go out at actually different frequencies and we just run this thing back and forth one time. And what did we discover? We looked at epoxy, we looked at Teflon, we looked at silicone and copper. You cannot groom epoxy. Because the barnacles or the fouling, once they settle there, they adhere so strongly that a grooming, by our definition, will not remove them. You have to clean them. Teflon the same. But you get into the founding control coatings and you really start to see a difference. This is Interspeed 700 and this is the Interspeed 640. And the groomed, wow, that looks pretty good. So we said, well, how's this working? And we sort of came up with some concepts. So here's a fouling release coating. The y-axis is adhesion strength, and here we've got time in days. And this is to try and give you an idea of what we see at our test site. It's a very high fouling test site at Port Canaveral in Florida. And if I look at adhesion strength, you know, you get this period where actually adhesion strength does increase slowly on a fouling co ooh, control coating. 
But then, for us in our test sites, after about a half a year, six months, most of the fouling release coatings will actually, somehow, there's enough glue or whatever on the surface, they will become fouled. And then you have to clean. And I'll show you later, when you have to clean, you typically damage those coatings. So with grooming, what are we trying to do? The moment we're on this borderline here, we then start our frequent proactive grooming, very light wiping of the surface. And one of the things that fascinated me, I can't remember who gave the talk this morning, but they said if you clean a ship, you should leave within seven days, right? Ten, was it? Ten to seven days. And we find the same with grooming. If you don't groom within that time frame, then they will, if they can, if they're present in the water, they'll settle. So now it looks like it's a copper-based coating. How does copper work? It releases copper into the environment, right? And typically, you start with a fairly high release rate, and it travels down and down. And again, this is under static immersion, right? And once you drop below this magic number, and I was talking to Colin about this. We both had agreed. It seems historically, and from our work, it's about 10 micrograms per square centimeter per day. You get fouling. But then you have to clean. And then you're into this sort of sore pattern of cleaning, cleaning, and everything else. Up here, you've got excessive copper output. But what do we do with grooming? Right? Now, again, we do about the same thing. And what we're trying to do is maintain copper output in this optimum value where you're not really increasing input into the environment, but you're controlling power. So to do that, how do we do it? This is meant to be ultimately an autonomous vehicle, so we're very concerned with power. You can't use water jets. You don't want umbilicals. So brushes is what you have to work with. And what we said is, OK, let's look at a grooming zone. That grooming zone has to groom before recruitment and adhesion reach a value where you can't groom to remove them. What about biocide release, coating wear? Again, you're doing it before you impact either those values. And then again, because we want to be autonomous, your force and power need to be in this area. And so if you look at brushes, it's amazing how little information there is on brushes. Toothbrushes is about the only information you'll get. Bristle type, tough design, arrangement, and operation. And you know we've been working on this for a long, for a long time. And in the same time we've been grooming, we've undergone those brush developments. This is our standard grooming brush at the top, Intersleek BRA640. You may not see it from there, but to us, there's a biofilm, right? I mean, most people say it's clean, but there's a biofilm. Hybrid grooming brush, by altering the bristle and tuft design, we now have a brush where we can really keep this stuff clean. You could eat your breakfast, dinner, Lunch doesn't matter of what. And it's the same with fouling release. We have another sort of brush so that your tufts, your bristles, your studs, whatever you're doing to clean, has to be designed to basically be within the grooming system. OK. So we had these ideas. We started to develop the concepts. But this is meant to be with ROVs or autonomous vehicles. So we had to build a test site that basically could accommodate that scale of testing. And here we are at Port Canaveral on the top left. And we have a support vessel. I bought an old trawler, 34-footer. We have a static platform. We do dynamic testing there and what have you. But our test sections up here, they're 8 by 15-foot quarter-inch steel plate. And we welded them to a 30-inch diameter steel pipe. And basically, these float so they hang vertically in the water. We've got three of them. So actually, I can deploy a 45 by 8 foot test section, and we can really start to run ROVs or whatever to try and you know, bring this whole thing to. So here we are deploying a C-Bodix, which was one of our uh, uh, ROVs we used to basically drive our grooming tools. And then to inspect the panels, all we do is we move our support vessel forward in the slip. We bring one of the panels through. We put uh, some um, rope on there, and we lift her up to the horizontal, and you can walk out and we measure DFP and we measure hull roughness. So we can now continually observe how our uh, basically grooming is affecting the coding. So results, right? Here's Intersleek, about a three-year exposure, not groomed. 
The red lines are where we do cleaning, the red dotted lines, and the black dotted lines are where we have to evacuate for hurricanes. We've just gone through a hurricane evacuation. It's a, I won't say what it is. It's kind of annoying. But here's typically what that fouling release coding looks like. If I look at groomed, basically pretty nice. Eh? You can see this is what we call tenacious biofilms. Very thin. I mean, hydrodynamically, I don't even know if they add to grab, uh, to drag. But, you know, we're scientists, we've got to document everything we see. But it's very effective. You're proactive, you keep this thing clean. If I look at the results, dry film thickness, as you would expect, that should not change with a, a silicone. You, you shouldn't be doing anything to the thickness. If I look at coating roughness, again, nice and smooth, but this is kind of interesting. What's happening here? But look at the error bars, they're huge. We have a fish called a sheep's head, and they'll bite on that silicon coating, and I think they use it like chewing gum. So what you're seeing here is divots, which have been created by a fish. I can't do anything about it. But basically, no. I mean, there's no effect on roughness. OK, copper. Copper is more interesting. We have the copper-tolerant barnacle Balanus antitridum. And back in the 40s or 50s, I can't remember, I think it was a gentleman called Weiss, he basically demonstrated that certain organisms have tolerance to copper, and this is one of them. So this is about a five-year exposure. And again, the red, the dotted dashed vertical lines are when we do a cleaning, and we try to do a cleaning which really imitates the uh, Navy uh, ship technical manual, and the black lines are where we've done a hurricane evacuation. The pink, or the red there, is barnacles. And you look at the barnacles on that panel there. And so this is, you look at every ship or boat tied up in Port Canaveral, they're all covered in these barnacles. There's just no way to, to raise a barrier. But what happens if we groom? And basically this is after about five years, we do a red, black, red coating, right? So we've just gone through the red to the black. It's not bad for five years. That's about 125, 130 micron dry film thickness coating. And now if we look at dry film thickness, the interesting thing is, and the dry film thickness tells us the rate at which we're basically eroding or polishing back or blading, however you want to call it, the copper. The groomed and the ungroomed seem to follow a very similar line. So our grooming doesn't seem to actually cause any increase in copper output. The nicer thing, if I look at coating roughness, grooming keeps beautifully smooth. That's the green line at the bottom. But where we clean, even though now we're, you know, we're sending students down and they're, they're not cleaning like a big commercial brush, you're getting roughening. And roughening is hydrodynamic drag, etc. So comparing cleaning to grooming. We left one of our panels ungroomed for about two years, and it was really because we had some operational problems with ROVs and we were actually, you know, things happen. Pre-cleaning, interspeed on the left, interseek on the right, and what you see is, here's our commercial, it's hand clean, commercial brush, and I'm sure you've all seen this before. Once you get a hard fouling there, if you want to get it off and you don't still get all the barnacle base plates off, you've taken all your coating off, right? And however careful you are with the silicone, you're likely to damage that too. And if you look at aggressive cleaning, we said in that one clean, we lost between four to 28,000 micrograms per square centimeter, which is equivalent to 200 to 1,400 days at a natural release rate of 20 micrograms per square centimeter. And then if we look at the condition that's groomed for one year at the top, and that was cleaned after 22 months, and when we look at the hull roughness, Y value there, as applied coating was about 90. Groomed weekly for one year, it actually got smoother. It dropped down to about 75. Cleaned after 22 months, we we're up around maybe 300 microns. A huge difference. The penalty to being about 1% for every 10 to 20 microns change in roughness. So very significant. I'm wondering if the battery's going on this thing, actually. Can I do it like that? Yep, okay. 
So how do we measure copper output? How do we measure what's happening on? There's an ISO standard. And the ISO standard allows you to calculate the copper release with respect to the change in dry film thickness. So I can take this little uh, formula here, and I can measure the mass biocide release in micrograms per square centimeter per day. And there is a dry film thickness, which is my unknown. I then put in the sort of values and for the coding, percent copper, and, and all these sorts of things. And I can come up with this relationship, and it's a linear relationship with copper discharge on the left, micrograms per square centimeter, with coding thickness on the right. So one of the things we measure is change in dry film thickness. And the elephant in the room is, are we contaminating the port by releasing extra copper, right? So here are the results from basically our five-year, well, not just our five-year, but a lot of different grooming studies on the industry. On the y-axis, you've got the copper release rate, micrograms per square centimeter per day. I'm saying below 10, we get fouling. No grooming, and a 20, grooming once every 28 days, we're below that value. And we get barnacle fouling, right? It's magic. The numbers actually work. On our 14-day, 7-day, and 3.5-day and grooming cycle, these are the values that we got. In fact, we're, you know, we're running about 14 to 18 micrograms average per day. And so if you match your brush, if you match your grooming forces to your coating, you should theoretically be able to maintain them at an optimum sort of biocide output rate to, to control fouling. I went to this great paper put out by Morrissey et al. I mean, it's just fantastic. It's just so full of useful information. Copper released, again on the y-axis, micrograms per square centimeter from an aggressive clean for an SPC and an ablative. Again, 2,000 to 3,000 micrograms per square centimeter. Just huge, one clean. And that's really why you have to you know, uh, treat the, the effluent capture when you're doing a clean. So, what about grooming and other uh, fouling control coatings? Three fouling release coatings, A, B, and C. Two copper coatings and one copper free at our test site over a period of just over one year. If we groom them, they all keep clean and fouling. If we don't, they all become foul. And you know, looking at some of the pictures of the fouled boats around here, I think there is, you know, for, for boats and ships that spend any time static, they're going to foul. So you've got to do something about it. Unfortunately, we didn't get any uh, uh, release mate measurements on them. So, Summary, grooming versus cleaning and capture. This is Harrison with our present homemade grooming device, right? Vehicle weight, 25 kilograms. The mini pam pampers, 130. One of the criteria was we wanted to produce a tool that someone could carry down the dock and throw in the water, right? Power, 300 watts, 30,000 watts. Cleaning swath, about the same. Cleaning velocity, a lot less. One of the things when you go to an ROV or an AUV, you're not worried about the time the diver's in the water. This thing I could leave out for a year, right? Well, maybe not, but I don't mind if it's there all day. And if, it's, if you get the semi-autonomy in it, then you don't really have to spend much time uh, controlling it. Efficiency, about the same. Grooming rate, we're about a quarter of a uh, mini pamper, and that's the... Uh, Time to groom a DGD 51. So proactive, reactive, gentle grooming tools, powerful brushes, no divers, divers, no fouling, fouling penalty, coating longevity, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to be proactive. You can't just sit back and, you know, you have to have this as a, as a management plan. So to reality, we're pretty excited. I mean, we get great data up there. I mean, those panels, they're just pristine, right? And it's not really too much bother to, to maintain them. Remaining questions. I'm a professor. That's how I earn money. I don't earn money by cleaning boats. Right? What is the optimum grooming frequency? I think seven to 10 days is about it. I don't think you're going to get away from it anywhere else, because that's amazing to me. You made that comment, and someone else made the comment, too. 
So if you're going to be proactive, that's about how frequently you're going to have to get in the water. Operational schedules, ships at sea, they come into port. I mean, the idea is they come into the port and, or they uh, go to anchor or what have you, you start a grooming schedule. Requirements for different coatings, well, that's different brushes. And grooming tool design and operation, again, uh, requirements for the coating type. And I would also say priority areas of the ship. To me, the low-hanging fruit is just the sides of a ship, right? I mean, even if you don't do the whole ship, which you can't do, you're helping the ship's performance and you're helping the diving crews who had to go in and do the niche areas and all the rest of the stuff focus on the job at hand rather than having to rush from A to B and, and, and go everywhere else. To reality, well, where are we? We're now working with Green Sea and hardening of grooming tool design. You know, we do 3 printing, 3D printing of everything and what have you, but you've got to harden it. Vehicle selection. And Green Sea are experts at navigation and control. And really, everyone, if you've got a robotic system, you don't want to tie up a half a dozen people sort of standing around making sure it works. You want to press a button, go away, and leave it. The elephant in the room, as I said, is regulations for discharge. And that's about my story, so thank you.